There we go, it's being recorded. Yes, hello everyone. My name is Nevin Akaiden. I am a librarian at Santa Clara City Library. We are so happy to host this talk again, <laughs> um, presented by uh, Don Dorsten, who is a longtime engineer at NASA Ames Research Center uh, in California. Thank you, Don, for your time and for your generosity for sharing your knowledge and experiences with us. You're quite welcome. I'm happy to do it. So thank you again, Nevin, for the opportunity. Um, <clears throat> so I'm curious, this is actually my fourth time speaking to the Santa Clara City Library. Yes. I guess Nevin and the others like my talk, so I'm doing it again. Um, so for those who have seen this before, much of it will be the same, but I have added a lot of new material. So if you have seen my talk, either in by Zoom or by being there in person at the library to give two talks there in person, then just say something in the chat. I'm curious about that. I see that we have 57 participants so far, which is great. I'm excited. Um, so I'm happy to tell you about this. So as Nevin said, I work at NASA Ames Research Center. That's Mountain View, California. Um, I have spent my entire career at NASA Ames. It is my first and only job that I've ever had since graduating from college. And uh, maybe some of you might venture a guess as to how long you think I might be working there based on my how, I, how old I look. But I will spare the wondering. I just now passed 42 years of work experience at NASA Ames. So it's been a great career so far. And I'm probably going to work a couple more years because the work is very exciting. It's a very exciting project that I'm on. And I'm glad to be a part of it. So. Let me move on. I will tell you more about this airplane that you see in the slide a little bit later in the presentation. That's kind of the climax of the presentation. But um, why isn't that changing? If I do that, okay. So <clears throat> give you a brief outline here. Uh, talk a little bit about supersonic flight. Uh, I assume that most of you are familiar with what that is. Um, and most, many of you are probably familiar with um, shockwaves and sonic booms. But if you're younger than middle age, then you probably haven't actually heard a real sonic boom. When you see airplanes fly at air shows, they're not going supersonic and they're not making uh, sonic booms. So I'll tell you about that. Uh, we study supersonic flight with CFD, computational fluid dynamics, wind tunnels, and flight test. And then I'll get into talking about the low boom flight demonstration mission where we're going to fly a real airplane <clears throat> flown by one test pilot, and that airplane will hopefully have a quiet sonic boom. So then I'll tell you about what some other companies are doing and finally reach a conclusion. So first, the brief history of supersonic flight. Um, before I turn the page and say what kind of airplane that is over on the right-hand side, if you know what it is in the chat box, uh, please enter it in there and I'll give you a woohoo if you get it right. So actually I'm not gonna hold up the presentation, but um, <clears throat> there you can see it. In the top picture, it says, that was the first airplane to exceed Mach 1 in 1947. Um, the Bell X-1 flown by Chuck Yeager and he just barely got above Mach 1 and he was at 43,000 feet. So that must've been exciting for the people on the ground to hear a sonic boom for the first time. I don't know if they really expected that or, or if they knew what they were gonna get, but um, that's what they got. Then it was uh, six years later when a Douglas D-558 Skyrocket was the first airplane to break Mach 2. And then uh, three years after that, there was an airplane that broke Mach 3 for the first time. So, <clears throat> Um, those are some of the early experimental airplanes uh, that have broken ground for us and they broke the sound barrier, so to speak. Uh, if you're wondering how Mach number is defined, uh, a Mach number of one is the, at the speed of sound. It's the aircraft speed divided by the speed of sound. And so if you're above Mach one, you're going supersonic. If you're below Mach one, you're going subsonic. But there's an engine between that we call transonic, and I'll tell you more about that later. So for commercial supersonic transports, there have only been two types that have been built in the world. 
and these were built back in, <clears throat> in the 60s. There's the uh, British and Air France Concorde. Many of you know about that. Maybe some of you have ridden in it. If you have gotten a ride in the Concorde in the past, um, please put that in the chat box. Um, I wish that I had done that, but I know that tickets were very expensive. So the Russians also built a supersonic transport called the TU-144. And it was in commercial service for just three years. They had a couple of crashes of it and it wasn't very reliable. Uh, the Concorde was a much more reliable airplane and had a very successful run, but it was just not economically viable. The government had to help subsidize the cost of operating it. It was very fuel inefficient and had an extremely loud sonic boom. So to give you an idea about how loud the Concorde is, I'm gonna play this video here and you'll see it taking off and passing up ahead and then there'll be a it will um, pass over ahead and make the sonic boom too. Very loud airplane. Wish I had heard it. <laughs> you like your reaction? Saying, oh, that was loud. So that's the Concorde. I wish I had flown on that or seen one take off. But uh, I did actually see one at an airport when it was just on the ground. It's an impressive airplane. In there in museums now, too. Anyway, what's interesting is that for the past 60 years, we really have not learned how to fly faster than the speed of sound. And I'll get into that. And that's to do with the amount of drag that's produced and also the sonic boom um, just being too loud <clears throat> that uh, the FAA has not allowed it. But you can see, as in the examples I show there, the Boeing 707 and the 787, uh, they're about 60 years apart in their development. Um, or about 50 years apart, I guess. And uh, there's still a tube and wing, very similar designs. They're certain, the 787 is certainly uh, very efficient compared to the 707, but still, you know, we're limited by not going faster than the speed of sound. So is there a demand for supersonic flight? Well, heck yeah, <laughs> big demand. But of course, ticket prices will be high for it. But the big draw for supersonic flight is getting somewhere that's far away in half the time. Um, these circles here are showing um, how far you can get if you fly from New York going westbound, you can get you know, out to Hawaii in five hours, wouldn't that be nice? In 10 hours, you can get to Eastern Asia and even down towards um, Malaysia, maybe even Australia there. So <clears throat> they're saying that with the supersonic aircraft, it can redefine a 12 hour workday. You fly there in five hours or so, you get two hours on location there and then fly back. So 12 hours from the time you started, you could be back at home. Um, so that would be great. There's certainly a huge market for it and a lot of pent up demand, but it's still gonna take a lot of work to make that a reality. So our vision for supersonic flight <clears throat> is that we would have an efficient, quiet, uh, low sonic boom airplane that can travel basically about twice the speed of current airliners. Um, <clears throat> it was in 1973 when the FAA first banned supersonic flight over land because the boom was just too loud, but there was such strong interest. And now there are some companies that want to build supersonic business jets and ultimately commercial transports that people could fly on. So. We're hoping that that will become a reality. Um, I think the first supersonic business jets will probably come out toward the end of this decade, which would be nice. So I'll talk to you about shockwaves and sonic booms, and I'm going to use some video and pictures of the Blue Angels to, uh, to discuss that. So first, though, I'm going to play this nice video. If any of you have been to Fleet Week in San Francisco and seen the Blue Angels fly, or anywhere they fly, actually, uh, it's quite a treat. 
So here's a series of three low passes of the Blue Angels flying over the bay near San Francisco on Fleet Week. I just like that. <laughs> I like those videos. Here is one more, uh, just one airplane pass, uh, same kind of Blue Angel airplane flying by. Um, but in this one, watch for the condensation of the air. It's the water vapor in the air that condenses when the air pressure around the airplane gets low enough. And it gets low because the airplane is going nearly supersonic. And so the pressure decreases over the wings and over parts of the body. So watch for that as you see the airplane fly by in the video. So there it is, there's a little bit of the wings. And then you'll see more of the condensation as he pulls up. Look at that. That's impressive. I never get tired of watching better airplanes fly. That's pretty cool. So here's a nice picture of one of the Blue Angels flying by during Fleet Week. And what I want to point out here is that you can see the shock waves. Um, the shock waves are just an abrupt change in pressure of the air flowing around the airplane. So the shock wave is not like fog or anything. Um, it's just a distortion of the air. And so since it's an abrupt change in the pressure, that means the density is changing over the shock wave too. And with that density gradient, you know that light from a background source will be refracted by any density gradient. And so the light waves will bend a little bit. And that's the effect that you're seeing here. So you see, just downstream of the canopy, <clears throat> the airflow is sped up to a little bit above Mach 1, and then there's a shock wave here where the airflow slows down below Mach 1, just behind the shock wave. You can see other distortions in the airflow pattern over the aft fuselage of the F-18, and that's because of the density gradient there. And then around the vertical tails, uh, there are certainly more shock waves here, and you can see them even extending fairly high and what's really interesting is you can see the shock waves come from the bottom of the airplane and from the area around the engine nozzles. And so those sudden pressure changes in the airflow around the airplane are what is causing the uh, water to be disturbed below the airplane. Even though the airplane is not touching the water in any way, it's the shock waves that are distorting the water there. So let me show you this little illustration to, to um, try to clarify what I was talking about there. If, if an airplane is flying just sub below what we call a critical Mach number, then there are no shockwaves that form around the airfoil and, and the airflow is just all subsonic there. If you go above a critical Mach number, which is defined as the Mach number at which the shockwaves just start to appear over the airfoil or the airplane, um, then the curvature of the airflow will cause the airflow to accelerate. It always does, whether you're subsonic or supersonic. Any curvature of the airfoil or any kind of shape that's curving away from the flow will cause the airflow to accelerate. So if you're going fast enough, and if there's enough curvature, then you can get some local supersonic flow uh, at that point. But then as you get toward the rear of the airfoil, the curvature becomes a little bit less, and you can get a normal shock wave there. Normal meaning roughly perpendicular to the surface as opposed to an oblique shock, which would be angled way back. And I'll show you examples of those in a little bit here. So you have supersonic flow over part of the airfoil, then there's a normal shock wave, which is an abrupt change in pressure or an abrupt change in density. And behind that, the flow is subsonic. 
So you're not seeing any more shock waves there. But what you also see is that there's possible separation of the airflow um, behind a shock wave. And so if you accelerate even more, you get more supersonic flow, you have a stronger normal shock, and you probably have more separation uh, behind the airfoil. Um, so all of, the, all of these are the start of the transonic speed regime. Uh, transonic extends into supersonic, and when the flow over the airplane is entirely supersonic, then you're out of transonic and you're fully in the supersonic speed regime. So what is the sound barrier? <laughs> so many people think the sound barrier is some kind of physical phenomenon in the sky that when you break Mach 1 for the first time, you break the sound barrier, you get the sonic boom and you hear the loudness and then the plane's going supersonic. Well, there is no such sound barrier in a sense of something that the airplane passes through that makes a sonic boom. It's not any physical barrier in the sky. It's just that the plane is using its engine thrust to go faster than Mach 1. And you'll see in a moment that I'll show you some more illustrations about it, that the sonic boom continues with the airplane over the whole length that it's flying. So, <clears throat> Um, the incorrect notion in the press that Mach 1 was a physical barrier that could not be crossed or done so only at great peril. It might have been conceived because of two things. There's a lot more thrust that's required when you are going supersonic or even get past Mach 1. And because of the rapid changes in pressure over the airplane, the wings and the tails and all that, if you don't design the airplane right, you can get into some serious control issues with your elevator control or your ailerons or rudder control or whatever. And they did have those problems in the early supersonic airplanes. So, but they quickly learned how to resolve that and to maintain proper control. And they figured out, you know, if you have enough thrust, you can go supersonic. The X-1 was powered by rocket engines. They didn't have jet engines that could propel it fast enough but they got supersonic because of the rocket engines. So the shock waves go out from the air, airplane in all directions. And <clears throat> then the, those that reach ground are heard as a sonic boom. So the sonic boom is continuous. If a plane is flying from New York to LA, everybody in between while the airplane is going supersonic will hear the sonic boom. So I mentioned, the drag increases a lot and that you don't need a lot more thrust to, um, to go supersonic. <clears throat> so how much does the drag increase? Well, I have a plot there on, on the right that shows a drag coefficient and the actual drag. Um, as aerodynamicists, we talk about drag coefficient. You can see the uh, definition of the drag coefficient here in this little equation. CD, coefficient of drag, is equal to drag divided by Q, which is the dynamic pressure of the air, divided by a reference area. And so I put in the wing area here of 600 square feet, just as an example for this calculation. So on the plot, on the black curve, the drag coefficient actually goes down slightly as you go up higher in subsonic speeds. Then when you get to the start of the transonic region, and in this case, I'm illustrating that as about Mach 0.8, the drag coefficient will rise dramatically. And it's because of shock waves forming around the airplane, lots of pressure gradients there, and the airplane is experiencing just a lot more drag and it takes more thrust to get through that. Then when the flow is fully supersonic around the airplane, that would be what we call the end of the transonic uh, regime. And then the drag coefficient actually continues downward from there. But that's just the coefficient. And like I said, it's dependent on the uh, dynamic pressure of the air. So let's take an example. If we're flying at Mach 0.8 at 30,000 feet, I did the calculation for standard atmosphere. The dynamic pressure is 280 pounds per square foot. And your speed would be 540 miles an hour, roughly. So if the drag coefficient is 0 0.015, as shown here, then the drag at that point is about 2,500 pounds. If you look at the scale on the right, there's 5,000 pounds. So that's about 2,500 pounds there. If you were to accelerate to Mach 1.6 while staying at the same altitude, the dynamic pressure 
I don't have the equation for it, but it's one half rho v squared, one half times the air density times the flight velocity squared. So you can see that if you're accelerating to twice the Mach number, now your velocity is doubled, but your dynamic pressure is quadrupled because it goes with the velocity squared. So, <clears throat> um, and the drag coefficient will be higher at uh, Mach 1.6, you know, as shown in this chart. Um, and thus the drag itself will be much, much higher, almost 10 times higher than it is at the subsonic speed. So that's why jets need a lot of thrust to get through the transonic and get to supersonic speeds. So whenever you're going supersonic or the faster you go, the, high, the, the higher you wanna go to minimize drag. So you could see if you climb to 60,000 feet, you reduce the dynamic pressure and thus the drag is only a little bit less than twice what it was at the subsonic speed. So <clears throat> that's about as technical as I'll get. So hope that was clear to all of you. So what makes a sonic boom? Uh, this shows an F-18 fighter airplane flying subsonically in the left and Mach 1 in the middle and supersonically on the right. Um, for practical real world examples that most people would be familiar with, imagine yourself riding on a boat. If the boat is going very, very slowly and if you're sitting on the bow of the boat looking at the waves, you can sit on the bow and you'd be like at the front of this airplane and you'd see the waves lapping up in front of the boat. But if the boat speeds up a little bit, now the boat speed is equal to the wave speed and thus you don't see any waves coming out from in front of the boat but there are disturbances or waves going out to the sides. Then if the boat speeds up, then certainly you'll see no waves in front of the boat and you'll see kind of a V-shaped wave behind the boat, okay? So and just as a boat going on a lake, if it's speeding around a lake, you'll see those waves coming back from the boat the entire time that the boat is traveling at that speed. And it's the same with the airplane. The entire length of the supersonic flight it has the shock waves going out in all directions from it. So now I'll talk about what we call shock wave pressure signatures and then loudness from the sonic booms. So imagine the Concorde is up here flying at 50, 60,000 feet or so. If you were just below it as a passed over, <laughs> and if you had, uh, a microphone or some kind of dynamic pressure transducer to measure the pressure underneath the airplane that flies by, you'd see an increase in pressure at the nose of the airplane. You'd see another increase possibly around the canopy um, where the wing leading edge apex is, that is where the wing leading edge intersects the body of the airplane. Uh, you'd see another shock wave from that and that's this little shock here. Then you get back to the main part of the wing or the engine cells, you get another shock. Then as you get to the rear of the airplane, the flow is no longer expanding around the front of the airplane, but now it's kind of coming back together at the rear of the airplane. And, and thus uh, you see the reduction in pressure. And, and then eventually the pressure gets back to ambient pressure after the airplane passes. So like I said, the shock waves and the, all these air pressure gradients expand around the airplane in all directions. But in terms of people on the ground, you're interested in what happens to those shock waves as they go toward the ground. Well, physics dictates that the uh, shock waves and all these variations in pressure will eventually coalesce or merge into um, just a, a strong shock at the front of the airplane, a decrease in pressure as you go along the back of the airplane, <coughs> and then a um, another strong shock at the rear. So by the time it gets to the ground, you see a um, <clears throat> pressure rise, very sudden pressure rise, and then a decrease, and then a pressure rise again. And so that is a sonic boom that you would hear on the ground. That's the boom boom that you heard from the Concorde. Now let's say that you have something like a low boom flight demonstrator airplane that's designed to have a quiet sonic boom. Pressure increase at the front would be very small, a small little blip at the front, and then other shock waves distributed along the length of it. But if you do it right, then you can get these shock waves to not coalesce into a sharp 
what we call an N wave, where it's steep at the front and the rear, but rather more like a sine wave, where it's a gentle curve. So that would have more of a sound of a thump thump than a boom boom. And that's what we're hoping uh, will be the result of the flight test for this uh, X-59 airplane that I'll tell you about in a little bit here. So the, the big design technical challenge is to develop and validate tools. And by tools, I mean computational flow dynamics tools, basic airplane design practices, you know, the knowledge and expertise to know how to develop supersonic airplanes that will have a fairly quiet sonic boom. So certainly NASA and the aerospace industry and lots of foreign companies and countries have been working on this sonic boom minimization for many years, many decades. Um, but we are learning how to do that. And so the ground signature for a Concorde looked like a big N wave, kind of a stretched out N here. But <clears throat> for quiet boom airplanes, you might have you know, something that looks more like an S wave. So as the sonic boom propagates to the ground, we've, we've simplified the diagram here and just showing the bow shock and the tail shock. But of course, in between, there's a lot of merging, a lot of um, viscous effects and effects of humidity and all that pressure and temperature that are affecting the um, shock waves as they go to the ground. And the uh, temperature increases as you get closer to the ground too. So the shock wave angle gets a little bit less. So that's kind of a, an illustration. If you can see the shock waves coming from an airplane flying at high altitude all the way to the ground, you might see something like that. But of course we have no way of visualizing that over that distance. So there's a boom signature carpet. If you think about the airplane starting out here in the lower left, climb to altitude, accelerate to supersonic, and it has this flight path directly under the airplane, and for some distance off to the sides, maybe 25 miles or so off the airplane flight track, you'll hear the primary boom. And so that'll be the loud boom, boom. And, and that can be pretty disturbing. But in addition to that, there is a secondary boom carpet that's much further out. And this could be a hundred or more miles away off to either side. And basically that's shock waves coming from the sides or the tops of the top of the airplane uh, going out in the atmosphere, bouncing off the upper atmosphere and coming back down to the ground. So that would not be a loud boom, but it might be a rumble sound, kind of like distant thunder. So how loud will the sonic boom be for the NASA X-59? And the X-59 is the uh, airplane that was on the title slide of this presentation. Um, the Concord sonic boom, um, it was typically around 105 decibels. If you were standing underneath it as a cruise by and you saw that video of the people on the ship and they saw the Concord fly overhead and it made a very loud boom. Um, you know, a loud rock concert it can be 95 to 100 plus, maybe even 110 decibels. And that is, you know, that's going to cause some ear damage. Um, basketball bounce, hand clap, you're familiar with those, of course. The X-59, we're hoping that the sonic boom level or the sonic thump from it will be on the order of about 75 decibels. And um, <clears throat> if your neighbor uh, slams his car door, you know, you'll hear that, but it won't be too loud if it's not, if you're not right next to it. So we're hoping that will be on that order. Um, so we shall see. Tools for studying the quiet supersonic flight. <clears throat> um, I see your question, why gas can't it be electric? I'll get to that a little bit later, if you don't mind, but keep asking questions. Um, we have three different ways that we study flight for any kind of airplane, not just supersonic airplanes. Uh, wind tunnel tests, and of course, that's what the world started with. Think about the Wright brothers and their Wright flyer that they flew in 1903. They had done a lot of wind tunnel tests before flying that airplane and you know, they didn't, there were no flights back then. Uh, they were the first ones to have sustained powered flight. And of course they didn't have computers, but now we have all three of those where we can simulate the flight on the computer and we can build airplanes and fly them. So for computational fluid dynamics, you start with a CAD representation, computer-aided design. 
Okay, so it's a bat, it's a mathematical model. You define every point on the surface of the airplane with you know a grid that's millions of points or at least you know many many thousands of points to define the airplane, and then you run it through a flow solver where you're predicting what the airflow is over the entire airframe and you're looking at the pressure distribution on it. So you can compute that pressure distribution from that CAD representation. And so here you see, you know, blue is showing very low pressure as the airflow accelerates over curved surfaces like the leading edge of the wing. Red is high pressure, uh, like this high pressure in the engine inlet and there are shock waves that come from the engine inlet as well as um, high pressure on this ramp leading right up to the inlet. So you, you can see a, you know, a full computation of the pressures on the surface of the airplane, but also all around the airplane. Um, this is showing slices of, of the uh, airflow around the airplane in the air off to both sides of the airplane. I think it's coming off to the right side and then it might be uh, the vertical slices going up from the airplane. Uh, as shown on the left side of the plane there. So <clears throat> we have the computers now to predict all that. And it's really um, a powerful tool that can tell us details about the flow in any part, you know, on the surface of the airplane or around it. So here's a cross-sectional view of the X-59 airplane <clears throat> with the pressures in the flow field and on the surface that are shown there. And uh, so the shock waves are in red, the higher pressures and the expansion waves where the pressure is getting lower are shown in blue. So you can, as I mentioned, when I first started talking about shock waves, that there's a varying pressure field underneath the airplane. So it starts out with a shock at the nose and then you can see there's kind of a change in the green contours here and then you get some blue contours. So, this is the whole variation in pressure under the airplane. And if you extrapolate that down to ground level, or, or in this case, just going out to three body lengths away, H over L is the height to your measurement distance below the airplane and L being the body length of the airplane. Um, you can see the varying pressure field under the airplane um, and above it. And then as you go, get further away, see a lot of these pressures kind of normalizing and they're kind of merging together. And, and so by the time you get three body lengths away, it's really fairly benign. It's much weaker than it was immediately below the airplane. And of course we have the computer codes to extrapolate this all the way down to ground level too. So here's another uh, shot of the pressures um, around on, on the upper surface and the lower surface of the airplane. And in particular, what they're highlighting here is the heat exchanger detail. So in the upper surface of the X-59, they have these two bumps on, on the sides of the body, just, just on the inboard wing area. So the bumps, at the front of the bumps, those are inlets. And this would be for air, for cooling of the avionics of the airplane and also cooling of the cockpit for the pilot. So air comes in there and then on the uh, bump on the right side of the airplane, just below the body in this picture, it shows it as red there and a little bit better in this view, exhaust air coming out. So there's no exhaust air coming out the left side, but it's just coming out the right side. So the point of this slide is to show that our computational fluid dynamics does a pretty good job of, <clears throat> of um, predicting the airflow around the vortex generators that are on the, uh, this part of the fuselage and on the flow going around these, uh, these bumps here. Okay, I see another question there. Um, okay, so you said, why gas can't it be electric? Well, yes, there are electric airplanes. Uh, there are, are no supersonic electric airplanes that I'm aware of. You need a lot more power to go supersonic. Um, someday, I hope that there will be electric supersonic airplanes, but we just don't have the battery technology um, or, or the uh, electric motor technology yet to, to propel an airplane at supersonic speeds. So for now, it's gonna be um, just gas. Batteries are certainly very heavy and they can take up a lot of volume, especially if you need high power output from them. So 
if you're a young person who wrote that question, stick around. <laughs> Hopefully you'll see um, electric supersonic airplanes in the future, but there are certainly electric subsonic airplanes flying today. So why is it so long? Um, let me get to that as I talk about your nine. Very good. You are gonna fly in a supersonic airplane sometime before too late, before it's too late for you. I'm hoping that there will be supersonic airplanes that I can fly in before it's too late for me, but I'm obviously much, much older. So I will talk about the length there. Cool. Hey, everybody write in their ages. I'm curious to see the age ranges of people that are on this. I want to know what the youngest person is and what the oldest person is that are watching this presentation. Well, this is fun watching it. <laughs> so many of you that are in uh, either grade school or junior high or something. Okay, I'm going to talk about wind tunnels. My job at NASA has been basically studying aerodynamics of future airplane concepts in the wind tunnels. That's been my whole career. So, hey, 62, you're two years behind me. Um, thank you for joining in. So in 2009, our project, the Commercial Supersonic Technology Project, um, put out contracts to Boeing and Lockheed to have them design future supersonic airliners that might seat maybe 50 to 75 people and to try to design them for low boom. Okay, so these are the concepts that they came up with. And then we made one ton of models of those. So here is a model of the Boeing concept. <clears throat> That's it's not me. Uh, my job is that I'm, I'm the sonic boom wind tunnel testing lead for NASA. And NASA needs to run a sonic boom test of some future airliner concept. They call me and say, Tom, will you run this test? And I'm in charge. I, I love this job and it's been great. So this model is just under 16 inches long. You can get an idea of the scale there. Um, in the background behind me, you see there's this flat panel and it's not really totally flat. It's an inch wide at the base and it goes to a very small 0 0.05 inch radius um, <clears throat> at the tip of this. And there are 420 little tiny pressure orifices along the edge of the rail here. And so that forms a line of static pressure taps with which we measure the static pressure distribution underneath the model at various distances. And so we can move this model closer to the rail and further away from it. And we can also drive it forward and back. So uh, and then we compare the results of that to the computer. So here's another model, same Boeing concept, but this model is almost three times larger than the previous one. And this was mainly to get good measurements of the aerodynamics of the airplane, the lift force, the drag, side force, pitching moment, et cetera. And so, so we had the sonic boom measurements from the other one and the um, aerodynamic measurements from this one. But this model is so large, it's about 43 inches long. It really is too long for that pressure rail where we can measure pressures over a length of 66 inches. But it was very useful for getting both the um, aerodynamics and the sonic boom. <clears throat> so vertical flight landing design, uh, yes, and I see that somebody has already answered that question. The F-35 Lightning, fantastic airplane. Um, and, and that is a supersonic airplane too. So all of this work that I've been talking about here is for a commercial service, not for the military. Uh, the military can benefit from it if they want, but the trouble is designing for a low sonic boom goes against the design principles for high aerodynamic efficiency for an airplane. Uh, you can probably get a better lift to drag ratio on an airplane that's not designed for a quiet sonic boom. But the FAA says no supersonic flight over land that's gonna create a sonic boom. So you're stuck there, you have to design for a quiet boom. So you say, what is the plane made out of? If you're talking about the plane being the models of the airplanes in the wind tunnel, these are almost all high strength steel. They're, they're solid bodies, high strength steel. Um, sometimes we use Airmed or Vascomax. Those are some of the highest strength steels. Uh, we use 17.4, 15.5 as different stainless steels for them. So they have to be very strong to withstand 
<clears throat> the air flows in the wind tunnel that go up to a thousand miles an hour, or maybe even 1200 in some cases. So here's a photograph of the Lockheed concept in the wind tunnel. You can see the airplane concept in the upper right, and this is the model of it. And here's a full shot of that pressure rail in the background there. So this tunnel strut moves back and forth, left and right in the tunnel. And then we can also, this is a linear actuator. We can also drive the model forward and aft in the tunnel to position the shock waves in the right places on the rail. So, <clears throat> hang on. So we, we vary the Mach number of the flow. We vary the height of the model above the rail. We vary the longitudinal position of the model. We vary the angle of attack of the model, that is the angle to the oncoming airflow. We can vary the roll angle of the model, lots of different parameters. And so we have just hundreds of test conditions, model positions and angles that we do in a test. So typical sonic boom test in our wind tunnels that aims would take usually about two weeks. It's running at two shifts per day, 16 hours continuously. And uh, <clears throat> this tunnel in particular, the nine by seven supersonic wind tunnel at Ames, um, it, it, its minimum Mach number for testing is Mach 1.5 and it can go up to Mach 2.5. And it can also be pressurized up to almost two atmospheres of pressure. So when the, when the tunnel is running at full power, full speed, you know, high pressure, it will draw about 175 megawatts continuously. That's enough to light a small city. <laughs> so the cost of that electricity, plus the cost for paying the people to run the tunnel and the amortized maintenance costs, they, they tell us how much it costs as we were doing a test. And it's almost $3 per second to run a test like this. So you can see if we're doing two, week, two weeks of running at 16 hours per day, that adds up to you know, more than a million dollars for a test. But that's how we, that's how we um, get our test data here. You asked about uh, why can't it be? What would, happen, what would happen to plastic or can the airplane be copper? Copper just isn't that strong. Plastic, you know, plastic models, uh, they don't survive the wind tunnels. We don't do that. So here's a Schlieren image. A Schlieren is a German word, it means streak or a streak line. So what we do is we have windows on both sides of the tunnel and we shine a bright light. The light is collimated. You have a point source, you put it through a concave mirror and the light reflects back through the tunnel going you know, all parallel through the tunnel. And then you <clears throat> focus it back down to a point and, and record it either on film media in the old days or nowadays on a computer chip. And you can process it and see the shock waves. So this is flow at Mach 1.8, and this is a photograph from the NASA Glenn 8x6 supersonic wind tunnel. Um, and so you can see the shock waves coming off the nose of the model. They're very faint there because the nose is long and slender. Uh, the, you can see some of the shock waves underneath the model. And then as you get toward the rear, uh, you can see stronger shock waves as you get back by the engine nacelles. And certainly the strut that's holding onto the model this is not a vertical tail. This is just a strut that's holding the model. It has a very strong shock. It comes up from the leading edge of that. So I guess this is a good time to talk about, you know, why is this so long on the airplane? So on the X-59, it's certainly a very long nose. On these Lockheed and Boeing concepts, they're very long noses. You want the shock wave up front to be very weak and you don't want any sudden increase in the cross-sectional area of the airframe because that would create a strong shock wave up front. You want to keep it all as gradual as you can for as long as you can. And granted, by the time you get back toward the rear of the airplane, um, you can't avoid having some strong shocks because you have engines back there, you've got the wings, you've got some tail surfaces and so on. So, <clears throat> but this is just a fascinating picture and I'll show you, um, some more pictures that are uh, Schlieren. So flight test is the third way that we study supersonic flight. Uh, let's see, you asked how thick is the metal? I assume you mean the metal of the wings on the airplane models. And when, when you get out toward the edges, 
we're talking about probably a minimum of 10 thousandths of an inch for the wing tips or the trailing edges. And the wing roots in these things are, well, let's see, in the big Boeing model here, this wing root is maybe a quarter of an inch thick right in this area. So it's not very thick at all. So T38 Talon, yay. Let's see somebody uh, pointed that out. And this is uh, an airplane that's on flight test from uh, Edwards Air Force Base. Here is a picture of shockwaves recorded in flight. You can see on the tail, it says ED, that stands for Edwards, and that's a T-38 being flown by students at the uh, US Air Force Test Pilot School. So <clears throat> this was taken by a technique that we call air boss. It's air-to-air background-oriented schlaring. So what it is that the airplane is flying over the Southern California desert area around Edwards Air Force Base. And we have another airplane that flies above it. In this case, a King Air, you know, the Beechcraft King Air, it's twin turboprop subsonic, maybe goes about 350 miles an hour maximum. So the King Air is flying along and then the supersonic, it's hard to get my hands going both ways here. King Air is flying along at higher altitude, maybe 30,000 feet. Then maybe at about 25,000 feet, the T-38 passes by underneath it. And the King Air takes a lot of pictures looking straight down at the T-38 as it's going supersonically. So you take a series of images as it passes. We're talking high speed cameras, high resolution. You take those images and you've got a variegated background in the picture because it's over the desert and you might have sagebrush or Joshua trees or just the dry, varied um, terrain. So in, in lining up all those pictures, then basically the airplane and the flow field around it stays the same, but the background is changing in all the pictures and with the right photographic technique, the processing, you can make the background disappear and that's what they've done in this. So the dark areas are where you have shock waves and the light areas are where you have expansion waves. That is where the airflow is curving over a, you know, a convex surface where it's, the, air is, the surface is going away from the uh, direction of the airflow. So you can see that there's a strong shock up at the nose. There's a strong shock wave at the canopy because the canopy is a bump in the uh, fuselage contour here. And then there's just, you know, here are the engine inlets on both sides, strong shocks from there, shocks in the wing. And then you see the expansion from this part of the wing. So it's fascinating. I love this picture. You can even see uh, the varying pressure field expansions and shock wave coming from the expansions and contraction of the jet plume coming out of the nozzle of the airplane. So here is an even clearer picture this is done with a better processing technique in the, than in the previous picture. And, and so all the shock waves and everything are even clearer and sharper in this image. So um, let's see, what is it not possible to take a similar picture from ground level? Okay, good question. And that's a good lead in because I'm gonna show you one of those. Um, so uh, let's see. So here is a side view image. The T-38 uh, rotated to a 90 degree knife edge angle underneath King Air as it flew by in this pass. And that's how we got a side view to look at the shock waves coming um, from below the aircraft as well as above the aircraft. So just beautiful pictures. Here is a shot of two T-38s flying in formation. And what's interesting is you can see <clears throat> Uh, that there is some interaction of the shockwaves between the two jets. You know, up in the front one, it's just its own shockwaves. But then if you look carefully at some of the parts of the image here in the second T-38, you know, there's some, some distortions in the flow. And in particular, you can see where the jet wake intersects the tail shock of the T-38. You get a dark blue band from that. So that's pretty fascinating to see that. I think the guys are pretty excited to, um, uh, capture that image. So this is now a computation done by CFD and CART 3D code. It's Cartesian um, flow solver code. 
and it's predicting the shock waves and the expansions around 2 t 38s information. And here you can see the interaction of the shock waves much more clearly. Uh, this is a simulation of Mach 1.05. And in this video, what they did is they interrogated the flow solution at all angles around the airplanes. So that as you rotate the viewing angle, you can see the differences in how the shock waves interact. So that's, that's such a beautiful view there. And uh, it'd be nice to be able to get that in flight, but that means you'd have to have a lot of different airplanes fully surrounding the T-38, taking lots of pictures as it goes by. So, <clears throat> Um, so, if you can take a similar picture from ground level, this picture here was taken from the ground. They, they planned out the flight path of the airplane to pass between the people on the ground observing it and the sun. And, you know, it's really good timing on the part of the photographer and it's really good flying on the part of the pilot to fly right at that exact point. But, um, he passed in front of the sun, they took a series of pictures, use the variegated background of the sun, and you take out you know, the background image and you process all these images and you get this beautiful picture of the shockwaves and expansions of the aircraft passing in front of the sun. We call this Bosco, background oriented Schlaren using celestial objects. Well, obviously the only celestial object for which this works is the sun, so. Uh, let's see. Okay, now I'm going to get into the low boom demonstration mission, the X-59 Quest airplane. Um, who knows what Quest stands for? Well, it's right here on the chart. Quiet supersonic technology aircraft. So this mission is to demonstrate that we know how to design an airplane to have a quiet sonic boom. There's been no other airplane that I know of in the world that was designed from scratch to have a quiet sonic boom, but this will be the first. It'll be flying sometime next year for the first time. It's still on construction right now. And uh, assuming that you have the video of me up in the corner of your screen or something, I'll show you this model. This is a plastic display model of the X-59. Um, you can buy this. I bought it from a NASA gift shop. It's about, uh, it's almost 19 inches long. Beautiful model. You can see it matches uh, what the airplane looks like there. Let me see if I can get it at the same angle as the airplane in the picture here. So <clears throat> really uh, helps you to see just you know how long the nose is. The nose is about a third of the length of the body, you know, from the tip of the nose to the canard. Um, but you know, for that you get uh, you know a very gradual buildup and pressure there and weak shock waves up front. So you too can buy one of these models. It's available from a NASA gift shop. And I have a link to that in the, uh, at the end of the presentation here that you'll see. So the goal here is to fly this airplane and demonstrate not only to the public, but to the FAA and ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, to show them that we can fly an airplane at supersonic speeds and that it will have more of a thump thump sound, hopefully 75 decibels or less, instead of a loud sonic boom. So if, if the FAA and ICAO are convinced that we have succeeded in producing a, a quiet sonic thump, then we're hoping that they will change the rule for supersonic flight over land. Right now, the prohibition is no supersonic flight over land except in military areas because of the loud boom. We want them to say supersonic flight is allowed if you can demonstrate that your sonic boom will be below X number of decibels. And we're thinking that's going to be in the low 70s range for the number of decibels. If you're sitting in a restaurant that is not jam packed and not super loud, but you have a fair number of people in there and you have the chatter going on, that's going to be probably around 70, maybe 75 decibels, depending on how close people are to you. So if you're in a, inside a restaurant and this X-59 flies overhead, then um, 
Uh, hopefully you won't even hear it. You won't even notice it. That's our goal. So Lockheed uh, got the contract to start building the airplane in 2018. Uh, next year, probably around the middle of the year, will be the first flight. Then they go through about nine or 10 months of envelope expansion, the flight envelope. Think of Mach number and altitude where they have to demonstrate that it flies safely at all those conditions. And, and we'll also measure the sonic boom from it or the sonic thump. And then in later years, 2024, 20, 25, we're gonna fly it around different communities, over different communities around the US to get the action to the, um, to the sonic boom. So you say, can you put that in a wind tunnel? This model, no way, <laughs> it's plastic. Like I said, they're made of uh, stainless steel. So as I already talked about the long nose for uh, shaping that forward shock. You have the fixed canard, that's for nose up trim. And it's also to help tailor the uh, sonic boom level because it generates some shock waves and it's kind of a, some preliminary shock waves before you get, before you get to the wing shocks. Uh, notice here that in the canopy, the pilot's head is not sticking up above the, the contour line of the nose in this part of the fuselage. So he has no forward vision. So I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. He's gonna rely on a computer screen in front of him. He's got these side windows here, but they really don't um, offer any forward vision. In fact, the view at the side window is partially blocked by the canard. So this canopy <clears throat> is literally the aft canopy from a T-38 airplane. So, and if you look at, uh, you look at the side view of P-38, you can see that the person in the rear, his only forward vision is if he looks around the guy in front of him, looks through the front of that canopy. Um, we have a T-tail on the airplane. This can be trimmed uh, within a few degrees angle range. And that is also to minimize the aft shock. This horizontal stabilator in the back is the primary pitch control for the airplane. But it has flaps here and ailerons for uh, flaps for extra lift during slower flight and later on, of course, for roll control. So here's the three view of the airplane. It's just about 100 feet long and it's very, very long and slender. You can see the wings are highly swept back. Uh, you can download this three view. The website is down below. Uh, for those of you who are quick, you can take some screenshots of any of this, you know, if you want to save that. And uh, again, you want to take a screenshot at the end when I give you some uh, website links. Look at that. One, I thought there were usually two unless it has to do with the weight of it and the fuel needed. One engine is sufficient to drive this airplane supersonically. Um, it's the GE F414 engine. Um, you know, many fighters have one engine, the F16. Uh, there's the F-18, F-15, F-14, they all had two engines. But the purpose of this airplane is not as a prototype for a future supersonic transport. It is just a flight demonstrator. So don't call it a prototype. It's just to demonstrate the technology that we know how to shape an airplane for a quiet sonic boom. So I mentioned how the pilot has no forward visibility. This is a computer simulation of what the cockpit would look like for the pilot. So he's sitting in here and you can see out the side windows. And of course you can see directly out the sides of the canopy, but that's just the side view. So he's got a large screen in front of him as well as the multi-functions that are common in glass cockpits in many different types of aircraft nowadays. So the airplane view here, we call this XVS, external vision system. There's a camera that's right in front of the nose of the airplane. This camera pod is right here, just ahead of the canopy. And you can see it sticks up just a little bit from the contour of the airplane, but you know the pilot cannot see over that. So we have the external vision system that is con constantly providing the view, looking out the front of the airplane and you know this triangle in here, that's the nose of the airplane that the camera is looking at. Then when the landing gear is down, we have an enhanced vision system where it's a camera mounted <clears throat> uh, in the nose wheel well, the, the green shaded area is not quite drawn back to the nose wheel, but that's where the camera is located. And um, 
Uh, <clears throat> so that will assist the pilot alarm. And so you can see they did a flight test here on a twin engine turboprop where they had the um, EVS camera mounted on the nose of the airplane and the other camera mounted up a little bit higher and they synchronized these two camera views. It's kind of a poor quality photograph here, but they had a pilot sitting back in the cabin of this airplane and he was able to fly the airplane just using these camera views. And then this lower view here is the view through the lower camera and that's what the pilot will see so that it can get a good view of the runway as it's coming in. Uh, regarding how far it can fly before fueling, that's a good question leading into this next chart. I'm gonna talk about the mission <clears throat> profile here. Um, again, this plane is not designed to fly very far <clears throat> or very long to fulfill its mission. So if it were to take off out of um, Kennedy Space Center in Florida, it would uh, depart, go out over the water, accelerate supersonic speeds, fly over a community like Orlando and neighboring towns at supersonic speeds, Mach 1.4 to 55,000 feet. Then it would decelerate, come back around, do it again. Actually, the, the big white line is it uh, shows it going back around. So it would make two passes. And when that's done, then it comes back to land. Uh, they want to do two passes to make sure that, uh, you know, if people miss the first one, then they can hear it the second time. And, you know, but they don't want to do this all day. So we're going to get the public's reaction to what we hope is just sonic thump. And we're actually going to allow people to respond, <clears throat> maybe through an app on their cell phone. From one to 10, how loud is that? Uh, or they can call into again on a website. And we'll probably have uh, various NASA people on the ground talking to some of the people, get, interviewing them and asking them what they thought about the uh, sonic boom. <clears throat> so <clears throat> wind tunnel validations. We have done a number of wind tunnel tests of this concept. Uh, in the upper two pictures, this is nine and a half percent scale model of the X-59 in the Glenn eight by six wind tunnel. This test was run, I think it was 2019. Um, and so this was uh, to measure the aerodynamics of the airplane, but also the inlet recovery. That is the pressure of the air going into the inlet and how smooth is the airflow going into the engine. And all this stuff behind you is um, <clears throat> stuff to drive a plug in, in and out of the um, rear of the nozzle to vary the amount of mass flow going through. So, so and they also pulled and ran that at subsonic speeds in the Langley 12 foot subsonic wind tunnel. And that was to measure the low speed aerodynamics and the handling qualities of the airplane. They built an even larger model, and this one's 15% scale, and it's in a fairly large subsonic wind tunnel, the 14 by 22 foot wind tunnel in Asa Langley. Uh, so you can see how big the airplane is com compared to the uh, woman in the picture here. So this was for takeoff and landing and slow speed flight studies. You can see they did an oil flow, smeared oil over the airframe, put a fluorescent dye in the oil and uh, imaged it with uh, uh, UV light and UV cameras. And, and they also looked at uh, some smoke flow visualization where the airplane is in the tunnel and, and the tunnel flow speed was very slow. And they had a smoke wand in there to visualize the vortices coming from it. So flight simulations, this is fun stuff. And this is something that we can all do since we most of us can't go fly a supersonic airplane ourselves. So you can imagine that NASA as well as Lockheed have built flight simulators to simulate what flying this X-59 airplane is going to be like. So the picture on the left is the flight simulator at NASA Armstrong Flight Research Center. It's next to Edwards Air Force Base in the Southern California desert. Uh, that was our NASA administrator, Jim Bridenstein, sitting in the cockpit there flying in that at the time. And what's neat about that simulator is if you look at the right side of the picture, you can see there's a panel here. This is an enclosure that can slide forward over this whole cockpit area so that the pilot sitting there feels like he's completely surrounded, and he is. Um, 
and that gives them the most realistic view of feeling like you can look out the sides, but you can't look out the front. Um, and then it asks the Langley, this picture is pretty old, and I think they've upgraded their simulator quite a bit since then, but it basically considered, consisted of the controls and a number of uh, video screens in front of and around the pilot. So that was a nice way for them to uh, um, <clears throat> be able to fly it. So the simulator at NASA Armstrong, I have sat in the simulator and flown that myself. And I found it very easy to fly and it was easy to get used to the idea of just looking at the computer screen, um, you know, instead of being able to see out the window. So, but if any of you want to fly an X-59 flight simulator, you can. You can download that, take a screenshot of this. You can see the website down below. We had uh, three, three interns, student interns at NASA Ames, and there were three interns at NASA Library at NASA Armstrong, and they formed three teams, and their goal was to develop the laptop-based flight simulator at the X-59. So they used the X-Plane software. They were given the airplane geometry, but we didn't give them the aerodynamics or the propulsion and all the stability control characteristics. They had to come up with that on their own. And so they built up the geometry, even put in the colors. These pictures here are from their flight simulations. And, um, and they did a great job with it. So you can fly any one of the uh, three flight simulation models that were developed you know, from the three NASA centers. And, and it's kind of fun to do that. <clears throat> I have it on my work computer. And when they need a break and want to do something fun, then, <clears throat> then I can go fly that. There's another question here. If you're going supersonic, but something goes wrong, you can bail out. Yes, there is an ejection seat in this airplane. Just like any fighter airplane, you have an ejection seat and you can bail out if needed. Hopefully that won't happen. You know, if it did, then we lose the airplane and the whole flight test program is over. Now I'm gonna show you a lot of um, pictures of the aircraft fabrication. This is being done at Lockheed Palmdale at Skunk Works. Uh, they're in Palmdale, a little bit southwest of Edwards Air Force Base in the Southern California desert area. And they have a special area set aside in their hangar for building the airplane. So this was a picture, this might've been uh, nine months to a year ago. I know it's much further along than that right now. There's a photograph of the actual engine that's gonna be used for this. <clears throat> Here's the way it's in the jig. What they did was they built the wing up in the jig, but they didn't put the top and bottom skins on yet because what they did was they rotated this jig 180 degrees so that the bottom was facing up. And they have this big Cobra machine <clears throat> that knows the geometry of the wing and knows where to drill the holes and put the rivets. And so this Cobra machine is doing all that automatically. It sure saved a lot of time from humans doing it and it was much more accurate and precise. <clears throat> so, these are pretty recent pictures of the airplane as it stands right now at Lockheed. So you can see that the wings, <coughs> the wing bottom skin, of course, is on, and most of the top skin is on too. Uh, the engine is not in place yet, but they have the engine inlet there. There's the vertical tail, the T-tail. We have the canards that are mounted here. The nose is not quite attached in these two pictures, but it's basically ready to be attached. So very close on that. <clears throat> Here's a from the basically from the front of the nose looking back, and you can see there's a gap still. They haven't uh, quite made it there, but that is one long nose. I imagine if you had people lying down, well, let's see, the nose is about 33 feet long. So if you had, uh, it would be five people is six feet, six feet height each, plus another half person for the length of that nose. Um, that's, that's a key feature of the airplane that's gonna give it the quiet sound boom. Here's a view looking at the right wing, the upper surface. <clears throat> um, and what you're seeing in the back here is, this is a fixed portion of the wing that goes in between where the flap will be over here on the left, and then the aileron will be over here on the right. And the trailing edge of those, of those two control surfaces 
will line up with the trailing edge here, this fixed portion of the wing. And you can see some of the forward fuselage out in the distance here. <clears throat> here is a, a side view of the forward fuselage and the uh, cockpit area. So the visible or the clear part of the canopy will be from the back end here behind the pilot up to this bulkhead here. And then there will be the small rectangular windows right here, but the rest of this forward section here will be covered. And that screen that the pilot will be looking at will be in this section here. So the ejection seat is not in, but obviously, you know, that'll go right at this point. Here is the vertical tail with the T-tail already mounted and it's being lowered down onto the uh, engine nacelle. You can see that this, this tube, this black tube inside here makes up the, um, the inlet air passage that will go to the engine and then the engine will sit down in here. And it's not installed yet. So here's a pretty good view of the entire airplane. Uh, um, canard germ plays launch and the tail is mounted. So it's really getting to start to look like a real airplane. Um, it's pretty exciting. So <clears throat> I'm just about done here. I have a video that I think you'll find pretty interesting. Right now when it comes to sonic boom, uh, overland flight. It's based on just a speed. Right now it is for civil aircraft, thou shalt not go over Mach 1. Uh, what we want to do is we want to change that regulation and base it on the noise and not on just an arbitrary speed. So low boom flight demonstrator project's goal is to design the test a vehicle that has a low noise sonic boom signature. The new sonic boom from the LBFD airplane or the X-59A uh, will sound more like a thump, we're, we're hoping. Uh, your traditional sonic boom typically sounds like two big cracks. Right now we can you know, fly F-18s, get some sonic booms, record them, measure information about the weather, and then use that to build models. We've done bits and pieces of tailoring the boom um, in flight and through the design tools. So this project is actually the culmination of activities like the Quiet Spike project that we had on the F-15 with Gulfstream. We've done tests such as FATE where we studied the rock cutoff and the extent of the carpet size. So six decades. So it's 60 years in the making. Shape boom demonstrator. This X59 is the next logical step. Well, the interesting thing about the X59 is that it looks really sleek and fast, and it is. And it looks like a fighter, but it's really not. As you've seen, it doesn't have a forward field of view, there's no windscreen. So, uh, because of that, we'll have an ultra. HD camera and an ultra HD screen, and that's what will be essentially our forward window. You know, there's a big bunch of the field of view that'd be blocked by the nose itself. Well, the FDS camera's on the bottom, so they can actually kind of fill in that whole picture and make it look like I don't have a nose on the airplane at all. Uh, now, we're in the design phase, and it's really cool to be in on the ground and in helping write the requirements and uh, helping uh, when it comes to uh, some of the little design issues. And then uh, three years from now, it's gonna be really awesome to get to fly this. Flight test will start in 2021. We'll do a handful of well, technical flights. This video is a little bit older. Envelope expansion. Flight test will be in 2022. We'll go into our next phase, which will be what we call validation. That's making sure that the sonic boom is as quiet as we designed it to be. And then we'll go into phase three, and then phase three is uh, uh, community response testing. So that's when we actually take the airplane out across the country, go to different communities and see how people respond to the noise we're generating. Once we clear the way for a new regulation,
then basically aircraft manufacturers can say, hey, if I can build to that regulation, I can build a whole new class of aircraft you know, from point A to point B twice as fast. If we can create an airplane that can perform like that, that can fly supersonic and not bother anyone and not have any problems with it, and that's, you know, that's awesome. If you look at X-59, it looks like, uh, you know, like the airplanes that we always saw in the 50s and 60s, the big old pointy airplane. When you look at it, you're looking and going, hey, this is that future we were promised 30 or 40 years ago. So if you enjoyed that, I love that video. Um, <clears throat> I've met um, those test pilots. I wish they could give me a ride sometime, but um, I know a number of those people there on the project. Um, so now I want to tell you about uh, companies that are building, um, <clears throat> hoping to build supersonic business jets. Arion is a company that are based in Reno, Nevada. <clears throat> they designed this airplane, a three engine airplane, and they went through a lot of effort in this. They had some design iterations. They really had what we thought was a viable airplane, but they have backed out because they realize that <clears throat> it's one thing to design it, but to actually build it, fly it, and get it certified by the FAA, they're figuring it's a few billion dollars by the time you've done all that. And you haven't even sold one airplane yet. And so to get you know, that amount of capital to certify it, they just didn't see that, uh, that it was a, a very likely a possibility for them. But the company called Boom Supersonic <clears throat> is still in business. They have built this XB-1 airplane, the, the one in the lower left here. It's just a flight demonstrator. Uh, just technology, but it's uh, just a single pilot airplane. But they have their, what they call the Overture, 55 to 75 passengers. <clears throat> it looks a lot like the Concorde. The shape is very similar to that of the Concorde. This would not be a quiet boom airplane, but at least it would be you know, a supersonic passenger jet. And uh, <clears throat> I, I don't know when they're saying that this would be ready to um, carry paying passengers. It would be at the very earliest, late this decade, if not sometime in the 30s. So another company that claims to be in the business, I don't really know much about what they're doing other than just seeing their fancy website, Spike Aerospace. They have an airplane that's called the S-512 saying that it would be Mach 1.6 and that it could fly over land because they're claiming that the sonic boom would be less than 75 decibels. And this would be more like a large business jet sized 12 to 18 passengers. <clears throat> but we at NASA don't have any ongoing collaboration with any of these companies. Uh, they're doing this on their own here. And we're working with Lockheed and building the um, X-59 just to demonstrate the technology but it will be up to the companies to design their airplanes and sell them and you know, take them to market and make a profit. So <clears throat> I wanna throw in this one just because it's an interesting shape and people may wonder about will there ever be hypersonic transports? Well, <clears throat> a few years ago, Boeing put out a press release saying that they've designed a hypersonic airplane that would cruise near, at nearly 100,000 feet it would go almost 4,000 miles per hour, more than Mach 5. <clears throat> and so basically it's going almost out of the atmosphere, you know, and then back in, this would be for long haul routes. Um, but the thing is, if you do the math to think about how long is it gonna to take to accelerate to 3,800 miles per hour? Um, <clears throat> I think the article said something about that. It would be about 12 minutes to get up to that speed. Well, if you do the math and calculate the G-force, the longitudinal G-force just from the airplane accelerating, that's about a quarter of a G that you'd be feeling. Imagine sitting in the airplane cabin and you're all sitting there, the airplane takes off, then you're slammed back into the seat with a quarter of your body weight pushing you back in the seat for 12 minutes as it accelerates. Uh, that'd be a challenge. So. You know, I know that big companies are working on hypersonics, but I think it's going to be a long time before that ever becomes a reality for passengers. In the meantime, 
we are hoping that with the X-59 flying <clears throat> within the next few years that we can demonstrate that it has a quite sonic boom and that supersonic travel for the masses will follow soon after that and hopefully you won't be able to hear it. So that's what we're doing. That's what we're all about and that's our goal. I thank you for the questions that you put in the chat. If you have any other questions, feel free to write them. Um, but I, I thank you all for listening. I really enjoyed giving this presentation and this is definitely the most exciting project that I've been on in my whole career. So thank you so much for your attention. Sorry, this went pretty long, but um, you can tell I'm pretty excited about talking about this. As always, thank you, Don, for um, the great talk and information. I loved it. Um, You're welcome. So let's.